The following program is a UW-TV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Welcome to Upon Reflection, I'm Marcia Alvar. The 1950s and 60s were an exciting time for dance, as choreographers like George Balanchine and Jerome Robbins put a contemporary and uniquely American stamp on the world of classical ballet. Whirling and leaping in the thick of that innovation was a young man from New York named Edward Vallella. The story of his struggle to become a dancer and to develop into the kind of dancer he wanted to be is told in his new autobiography, Prodigal Son, Dancing for Balanchine in a World of Pain and Magic. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Thank you. Look. I was really struck reading this book about sort of the twists of fate in all of our lives, and, and but for an errant baseball, your <laughs> life might have turned out very differently. Oh, yes, indeed. I, I can still feel the lump in the back of my <laughs> head. When I was about nine or ten years old, I was hanging out in the streets of Queens, and I got hit in the back of the head by a baseball, knocked unconscious, dragged home by my friends unconscious, put on the stoop. They rang the doorbell <laughs> and got out of there. Uh, however, my mother and sister were at a local ballet school. Uh, my mother was a frustrated dancer. She never had the opportunity. She was an orphan. When my sister came along, who's a year older than I am, uh, my mother decided here was a way to live vicariously. At any rate, when she heard about this, she got very upset, and she said, you are coming with us. She dragged me up to my sister's school, and I had to sit and watch 40 giggling girls, their mothers and me. Uh, they were waltzing around and doing all of these uh, very poetic, e ephemeral gesture until they started to jump. Uh, then I thought, gee, hmm, that looks interesting. And I went in the back and I tried some of these things and I found out I could jump pretty good. And I could do as well as these young ladies, if not better. And then I started to disrupt and make fun. And uh, uh, the teacher said, he either gets out of here or you stick him in tights at the bar. And I got stuck in tights at the bar. Your mother, uh, an incredibly strong-willed woman, was also responsible for you uh, meeting up with, with Balanchine. She was a fascinating individual. She was so far ahead of her time. She was a woman who in the, the late 30s and early 40s had already discovered health foods and Adele Davis and, and things like that. And she, she truly wanted to be ahead of the time. She didn't want to be behind the time. It was really the American dream that she wanted for her kids. She then started to investigate the world of ballet and she found that what was existing at that time was not really what she was interested in in terms of her daughter. So she found out about this guy called Balanchine who had a school, the School of American Ballet, and who was developing a major company. And she decided that that's what she was going to do for my sister. Took my sister in to audition for the School of American Ballet. And offhandedly, as they were about to leave after my sister was accepted, uh, she said, oh, incidentally, I have a son at home who also dances, but, you know, he's not really very interested. And they said, a son, a boy, can he walk? <laughs> and so they, they, they dragged me in. In 1945, we didn't have the kind of interest that's, that's evolved and developed now. Hmm. It, and you really were, you were in your sister's wake for, for a while. Your, your mother and your father were really focused on your sister's career as, as a dancer. When did, when did that shift happen that, that it became something you really wanted to do and you stepped to the fore? Well, about six months into this, after being totally humiliated and embarrassed by it, I suddenly realized that this was something I enjoyed. I was a physical kid, just hanging out in the streets doing sandlot stuff, but this had more line and form and structure and development and, and so on. I kept my counsel because, I assure you, in 1945 and 46, it was not the thing for a red-blooded American, Italian American kid to be doing, wearing tights. At any rate, um, as time progresses and I got on to, to the School of American Ballet, where wonderful, brilliant kinds of, of uh, development was available, I fell in love, in love with this stuff. Uh, my sister quit because that wasn't really what it was that she wanted to do. But by then, I was absolutely passionate about it. I knew this was the thing that I absolutely needed to do. It wasn't just that I wanted to do it. I wanted to live it. And that's what we need to do with this, this kind of stuff. You need 
to live it. You are the instrument, so you take the instrument with you all the time. And you've got to look after it and protect it. Was that a, a crucial point when your sister dropped away? Was there also sort of the assumption that, well, then, then you would drop away from it as well? Very definitely. Uh, my, my father in particular said, okay, that's enough of this frivolity, <laughs> uh, enough of this ballet stuff, and especially for my son who wears tights, which embarrassed him. My father ran a trucking business in the garment center, so he was not involved in the same sort of aesthetic pursuits that I was. And he said, okay, you're going to college. I said, I, I really don't want to go. I, I, I'd like to dance. And he said, college, dance, college, dance, college, dance. I went to college. I have a bachelor of science degree in marine transportation. I was sent to a military school. I'm a graduate of the New York State Maritime College, where I also won letters in baseball, and I was welterweight boxing champion because I had all of this physicality and no immediate release for it other than athletics. You, it was a time where you began something that, that really marked your entire career and that was moving back and forth between different worlds. The world of your family that was one, the world of ballet which was its own sort of hermetically sealed universe, the school, and, and you managed somehow to keep moving among all of them. It was a, a very curious situation for me. I, w I was coming out of a blue collar family and, and neighborhood and I was suddenly moving into a champagne world. As a matter of fact, the New York Times once accused me of being a beer drinker in a champagne world, which is <laughs> <laughs> really uh, essentially the, the, the dichotomy. And at first I was very uncomfortable in this new world. And, and I was very uncomfortable bringing back my new world to my old world. So it took me some time to navigate betwixt and between all of that. But I think that that's kind of a natural and normal extension of, of who we are, especially here in America. There is opportunity to move up, so to speak, in, in economic areas, but also certain kinds of cultural uh, circumstance and areas as well. When you were in school, there was also a phase where you were, uh, you were playing hooky at night, I guess you'd call it. And the call of dance became too strong for you to totally ignore it and, and set it aside. I was des desperately frustrated. I, I knew I didn't want to go to sea after three years of, of college and I was entering my fourth year and I knew that time was going by. This is, this is something you have to do now. Now is now. Now is not later. If, if you're very lucky, it takes you 10 years to train as a dancer and you may have 20 years as a, as a career. And I was already losing four years of, of training and, and, and I was, I was desperate to, to get something done. So I, I started to do uh, kind of crazy things. I needed <laughs> To get off that base, uh, I, I, I just needed to get into Manhattan to, to retrain myself and, and get back into this so I could present myself to Balanchine. So I had to jump ship all the time. If I had been caught, I would have been kicked out of school. I also needed money to pay for classes and tights and ballet slippers and things. So I used to uh, uh, come on the base with a, a, a case of beer and I'd, I'd go around with a laundry bag knocking on doors uh, uh, during study periods and sell beer to to earn money. Again, if I had gotten caught, I would have been uh, thrown out immediately. But uh, that, was not, that was not uppermost in my mind. My mind was set on achieving this, to reachieve what I had lost. If being, uh, dropping out of ballet school at, at, in your teens, going to college, it seems to have been a, both a blessing and a curse in some way to your career? Well, I, I think the, the blessing is, number one, I have an education. I'm delighted to have that. I have a degree. It is mine. It will never, ever be taken from me. It, it also uh, satisfied my father's yearning and my mother's sense of, of, of achievement for, for her child or their child. Um, but but the, the negative side of it was that, that even though I was boxing and playing baseball, that is very, very different from the world of classical ballet. It is not the same kind of investigation of one's physical potential. Classical dance is, is a thorough, balanced investigation from the top of the head to the tips of the toes. You know, if, if you're right-handed in baseball, you throw with your right hand. We throw with our right and our left. We do double dare tours to the right, also to the left. We, we have to balance within the body. So uh, when I went back after four years off, my body was very, very vulnerable and tender. Um, for instance, if, if you're a guitarist, you, you've got to develop calluses in your, in your fingers. You need to do the same thing with your feet. I was crazy. I just went back full force. You wanted everything I, at once when you got I, back. I, I <laughs> desperately needed to get this back in five minutes to make up for four years. And, and I plunged in. I didn't realize at that time that slower 
is faster. And I should have taken a year to kind of accomplish what I did in that first class. I, I bruised both of my big toenails, I lost, uh, big toes, and I lost both of my big toenails within a week or two of, of returning. But, but the, the agony, the pain was such a pleasure. And I was thinking, <laughs> my God, I'm, I'm aching again. Isn't that wonderful? Was that, is that a critical time? I mean, you were in your teens when you dropped out of ballet to go to school. Was it possibly the worst time in a dancer's life to, to take that kind of sabbatical from training? <laughs> Absolutely. I do not recommend it to anybody. Uh, it, it, became, it became the burden for the rest of my dancing life. Uh, I, I indeed traumatized my body and my muscles. Now, between those ages, the ages of 16 and 20, that is the development. You start usually between 8, 9, 10 or whatever, and it takes you four or five years to kind of acquire the vocabulary. And once you acquire the vocabulary, then you have to understand how to use it, make maximum use of it, and then turn that vocabulary into dance and finally into performance and art. And that, that takes a, a great deal of time. And if you've got those four essential years taken out, it's similar to, um, let's see, how, how can I explain it? It would be as though you started learning a foreign language when you were very young and then stopped and then returned to it much later. What happens is you begin to speak with a thick accent. And that's what I went back with. I went back with a physical thick accent, which I then had to work on to refine to get down to speaking the same language that everybody else was speaking without accent. Reading about the training that, that you got and the training that you didn't get in the, in the balancing world of ballet, I was really struck by how much more chaotic and laissez-faire the whole system was than, than I would have expected it to be. Well, I, I think that that's healthy and unhealthy as well. I think, I think you either sink or swim. And it, it also means it's survival of the fittest. So, so you really have to have this, this passionate drive, this emotional mania to, to do this stuff. There is no other way to do it. And, and I, I don't approach it the same way with the dancers that I am directing today. I, I don't do that. I, I kind of guide them from, from my mistakes and, and the circumstances and situations that I was, I was placed in. Unfortunately for us at that time, we were pioneers in all of this. Um, George Balanchine was not interested in, in us taking care of our bodies with massage and, and seeing chiropractors and things like that. He Even thought warming that, up, cooling down. Well, he, you know, our, our sense is that, that you need to, to do an hour and a half class, an hour and a half warm up to set you up for the rest of the day. It prepares you for six, eight, six or eight hours of rehearsals plus a performance at night. So that is an essential part of your development. It's, it's an essential part of your day. And Balanchine gave company class every day, but he was not interested in the, the logical aspect of carefully, patiently warming somebody up. He wanted to get to the choreographic principles that he wanted to instill in us so that they would become evident in his choreography. So instead of doing a 30 or 40 minute bar when we work at the bar before we start moving and jumping in the center of the floor, he would give a 10 or 12 minute bar. He would jump exercises. He would get you jumping before you were prepared. And me being this person with a traumatized set of muscles anyway, this was adding fuel on this raging fire. And I, I, I was desperate because my muscles were, were getting terribly cramped. I, it was limiting my ability to move. And I could see the end of my career coming within the next two to three years. I was desperately looking for salvation Balanchine, in a funny way, provided that salvation by inviting a teacher from the Royal Danish Ballet, Stanley Williams. When Stanley came, the first class I saw, I said, that is my salvation. I could understand it. I could taste it. I, the flavors were familiar. And in addition to that, Williams and I became instant friends. And Balanchine required all of us to be in his class every morning. We were obvious by our absence if we missed once. I stopped going to his class for 13 years. One of the major rebellions, <laughs> although not the only rebellion that you had with Balanchine. I was, uh, I was so amazed to, uh, to read in the book that uh, you weren't provided instruction, for example, in learning to really understand and work with the music that you dance to, and that when it came to partnering, which is an essential, you were really on your own. <laughs> I was a disaster as a partner. <laughs> you know, again, those years between, 
between 15, 16, and 20, that's the time that you learn this kind of thing about, about looking after a woman on stage, about lifting and putting down and all of this. I never did it, but when I entered the New York City Ballet, I said, hey, what's the big deal? You lift you know, her up, you, you put pick her them up, down. You put them down, that's all you have to do. I didn't understand that there was an art form within this art form called looking after a woman, supporting, and et cetera. It took me about three years to, to understand that. And the poor ballerinas, I, I used to learn how to partner with them on stage in front of 3,000 people, and most of them would be in tears in the wings before, during, and after. <laughs> if truth be told, you became a kind of pariah with <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the ballerinas like, who would say, oh no, uh, not uh, Edward. My, my social life was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> but, but once I became a good partner, uh, and I loved it, uh, these women started to ask for me as a partner. My social life improved a great deal. Hmm. For all of that, for all of the, the chaotic quality of, of working with, uh, with Balanchine, the level of devotion and inspiration this one man inspired is, is really remarkable. He's the single greatest individual I've ever had the pleasure of coming across, no less working with. Uh, he was the giver of all he provided. He, he gave us our careers. Uh, not only that, he, he tailored work to you. He had his own school, so he trained you in his manner and style. He watched you in that school. He got to know you there. He got to know you as an individual, as a personality, as well as a technician. And certainly when you were in the company, he was watching you all the time. And he would just wait for the moment that was right, and then he'd choreograph for you. And he'd tailor a work to you so that it was almost like a master tailor making an incredible wardrobe for you. You knew you looked elegant and beautiful, and you were unencumbered by this, this wardrobe. It just moved beautifully with you and for you. You were then raw material for his, his genius. Uh, he was very demanding, but in the most wonderful, generous, benign way, except in certain <laughs> aspects. And, in areas, uh, you know, he, he provided us with enormous challenge, the guys in particular, because his motto was, ballet is woman. <laughs> and he said, he said to me once, you know, men are porters. <laughs> they, <laughs> they carry women and present women. But, you know, by the same token, he made some of the most incredible roles in the entire repertoire of male dancing for us. It was so important to you to please him and to get praise from him, and, and it didn't come all that often. No, it didn't. Uh, he, I, I, I say today, was, was my artistic father. And this idea about naming a book Prodigal Son, uh, Prodigal Son was a role that I was very, very uh, long associated with. But I was prodigal in that, in, in terms of my artistic father, I basically left him for 13 years, but I returned. I returned things, which was understanding for, for the works that he was providing. And with my natural father, I was also somewhat prodigal in that um, he didn't talk to me for over a year when I, when I became a, a professional dancer. He didn't speak to me until he saw me on stage. And then, and after then he was very moved. Well, it was, a, it was very sweet. It was, it was our opening night in the uh, beginning of um, after one year that I was in the company, <clears throat> and I asked he and my mother to come and see us. <clears throat> and he reluctantly said he would come, uh, and I invited him back afterwards if, if both he and my mom enjoyed the performance. At the end of the performance, I had done three principal roles. He was expecting me to be way in the back in the court of ballet, and I was flying around doing all of these pyrotechnical <laughs> tricks. And the audience was, was very impressed, and I expect that they were. At any rate, I was on stage at the end of the last ballet. The evening was over, and I was dripping sweat, and the makeup is pouring down, and I've got my costume on. And Balanchine came on stage and began to tell me what I had done right and wrong. And we speak of physical language. We don't verbalize so much. And we are communicating, and this is going on and on. Curtain goes up. It's a dark house. Stagehand comes, puts the night light, disappears. He leaves, quiet stage. We continue our conversation. We finish, bow to each other, shake hands. He goes off stage right, and I was going stage left to, to my dressing room, and I suddenly heard and saw something in the wing. And there were my mother and father in tears, and the three of us stood on that stage laughing, hugging, and crying. And from that time on, my father became a ballot to me and <laughs> handed out my reviews and pictures in the garment center. That was a, a moment of, of reconciliation for you and, and your family. Did dance, dance drove wedges 
among members of your family. It was, it was particularly divisive uh, between your sister and your parents. That was very painful because my mother, being an orphan and, and working to, to provide for her kids everything that she was unable to have, it was an enormous disappointment for her that my sister really didn't want to dance. And it, it drove, as you say, a terrible, terrible wedge uh, between my sister and my mother and father. Uh, and and uh, barely was it resolved. Uh, uh, I would say essentially it wasn't. I had to, to ask my sister if she would if she would come to see my mother who was dying of cancer uh, much later on and I had to beg my sister to come and, and visit with my father just before he died as well. Um, so it, it was very difficult and I, I, I feel pained for my sister and I also feel pained for my mother because she was um, domineering, driving, passionate about all of this stuff and didn't understand my sister's temperament and her sensitivities, which were closer to my father. Mm -hmm. My father, being a truck driver, was still a very, very sensitive man under all of that. Th that was one kind of, of pain that, that was involved in, in your career. Another, the, the very real, very physical pain that ended your career very quickly. And when I read descriptions of what it was like for you to get out of bed in the morning, it, it really reminded me of the descriptions that professional football players give of what it's like for them to get out of bed the morning after a big game. We are very physical individuals and even though we don't get hit as people do in, in, in football, what we are doing is probably uh, considerably more involved in terms of involving the entire body. I mean I've got nine broken toes, stress fractures in, in both legs, I've got knee operations, I've got uh, two herniated discs, I've got a hip replacement which essentially ended my career. Mm. And, and it ended my career, um, I, I was dancing at the White House, I was dancing for, for President Ford and I had this terrible pain in my leg and I, after the performance I, I was boogieing with uh, Mrs. Ford afterwards and then I went back to my hotel, I couldn't sleep the whole night, I went back to New York and Bill Hamilton, the orthopedic surgeon of the New York City Ballet, x-rayed me and he said, your career is over. I said, wait a minute, Bill, <laughs> wait a minute. I was just dancing Corsair at the White House last night. So it was, a, it was a, an abrupt circumstance. But, but again, I was, I was a, a party to a very, very early time when, when I was dancing in live television on cement stages and, and dancing three, four ballets a night, eight times a week, and dancing all the pyrotechnical roles. I was, it was at a time when the New York City Ballet had 40-odd people, not 120 people as they have now. So the workloads, the entire approach to all of this stuff was so different. I want to take a look at a, a short video clip that was put together as part of a tribute to you done in, in 1987. We'll get just a little bit of a taste of some of those pyrotechnical moments from your career. Watching a performance with Villela was like watching a bird soar in the air. It was said that he seemed capable of hanging in the air at the apogee of a beat, longer than gravity would seem to permit. Leaping, spinning, dashing, he threatened to explode with vitality and ecstasy. His magnificent career brought him to the White House to perform for every president since JFK and to perform for English royalty, command performances with the Royal Danish Ballet and the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, where he received an unprecedented 22 curtain calls and was the only American ever asked to dance an encore. But the life of a dancer's body is not unlimited and injuries finally took their toll on Villela. Fortunately, he was already in great demand as a lecturer and master teacher. With the same intensity that he performed on stage, he expanded his artistic endeavors. In his role as a lecturer, he has educated and fascinated students and athletes, lifting the veil of mystery from the dance. From skeptical high schoolers to cadets at West Point, Villela's teaching not only increased their awareness of their own bodies, but they also came to appreciate the art of ballet. A little bit from the life of Edward Villela. You now have a company in Miami, and uh, it, you said a couple of provocative things about both the state of classical dance and, and the young dancers. One of the things you said is that the, it's sad. You say, you say it's sad to see some young dancers who have so much talent, but they want things to be too quick and too easy. 
I, I, I am particularly pained at, at watching young dancers who have wonderful pyrotechnical ability and they rely only on that. This is about seeking to be an artist. And I, I think that they short cut this kind of stuff and, and they don't have full value. Uh, competitions, for instance, today in, in the world of ballet, you get an 18, 19 year old kid who does incredible pyrotechnical stuff. They win a gold medal. Suddenly they are premier danseurs or, or ballerinas. And that's, that's uh, ridiculous because they, they then don't have the ability to go through the proper steps to achieve all of the experience that it takes to make an artist. This is about slower being faster. And it's, it's not about faster being faster. And that reaction comes very much out of your own experience and your own transition from a, a pyrotechnician to, uh, to an artist. You've also said that you, th you think classical dance is somewhat under duress. Uh, very definitely. I think that we have lost the major, major leadership of the last uh, quarter century. George Balanchine is dead. Jerome Robbins has now resigned from the New York City Ballet, basically retired. Uh, Robert Joffrey is gone. Alvin Ailey is gone. Martha Graham, etc. So we are, we are without a wonderful, wonderful kind of leadership. In addition to that, I think that we are now being fascinated by new wave, next wave, postmodern, modern, modern um, these, these kinds of things. Nothing wrong with that sort of stuff, but what is happening now is these areas are, are beginning to be primary in the classical field and it's no longer the extension of the classic line and, and tradition. There's a disruption. Does that make you feel like you have a special responsibility with your own company in Miami? I, I do. I, I feel my responsibility is to classical dance and, and through my experience with Balanchine who extended the classic line, took us out of the 19th century, took us into the 20th century, it's now incumbent upon those of us who were past this mantle for us now to proceed into the 21st century. And I wish you uh, the very best in your work, your own work, and your work with your company. Edward Valella, it's been a great pleasure to have you on Upon My Reflection. My pleasure. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.